do. We are live, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Thank you so, so much for joining us as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and conservationists from around the world. Uh, we've done over 150 sessions since mid-March straight to YouTube, and we've started welcoming back live teachers and families and more, and it's been really exciting having you join us. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today we continue our super exciting series with the Toronto Zoo. We have done over 10 programs with them over the last month and a half, uh, featuring things from tundra trek to tigers to Komodo dragons, koalas, and more. Um, so we're so excited to go back today. I'm going to introduce the topic we're covering in just a minute, but I want to do a quick housekeeping note to say, for everyone tuning in on YouTube, let me know where you're joining from. We love to hear where you guys are, are coming in from, from around the world, and you can type questions in the chat bar as well. If you're keen to, we are using the Slido app today. So I will link this in the chat bar, but you can use Slido to upvote your favorite questions, ask questions of your own, and take part in some quizzes and games. So it's Slido and the event code today is Cycle. So without further ado, we are joined live uh, by Mary Ellen at the Australasia Pavilion in the beautiful Toronto Zoo, where today she is gonna walk us through life cycles, how animals change over their lives, how they're born, how they grow up, and so much more featuring some really, really cool animals from Australasia. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Mary Ellen, and take us away. Oh, I mean. Is Mary Ellen, I'm a programs coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo. And while we are currently closed to the public in this current situation, that doesn't mean we have stopped caring for the 5,000 animals who call our zoo their home. And we're gonna meet some of those animals as we walk around today, learning about life cycles, how animals mature, develop, the parenting styles and techniques that are used to get them uh, to be the lovely adult animals we see in front of us every day here. To start us off though, we are gonna do our riddle of the day. So we're gonna go through it together. I'll give you a little hint. And at the end of the video, if you're the first one to get the answer, uh, you will get a shout out from Jesse. And I will be saying the answer at some point today during our little talk. Um, so if you get it right, you can enter it in the chat bar or in Slido, um, and we'll take a look for you in the chats as well. All right, so today's riddle is I'm not a reptile or a bird, Call me a mammal, but I don't belong in a herd. Inside an egg, you'll find my baby. I live at the zoo, I dare you to find me. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds to look at there if you wanna take a photo of it or anything. And I'll give you a hint right now. It's not gonna be one single animal is not gonna be the name. So the animal is not gonna be like a Komodo dragon or a snake. It's gonna be a term used to describe uh, different types of animals who all do the same behavior or creature feature or something along those lines. And I'll be saying it at some point today. All right, so we are going to get started with our topic today. So like I said, we're going to be talking about life cycles, how animals mature, develop. We're going to try and hit one animal from every classification, uh, if possible, today. And you guys are wondering what that is. We did a previous video a couple of weeks ago on animal classifications where we dove deep into uh, birds and fish and reptiles, amphibians and mammals and kind of the differences between them. And one of the main things we talked about is the difference between a live birth and an egg birth animal. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into that today about why some of these animals are truly born in eggs and why are some of them live? What are the advantages, disadvantages? We're gonna get into parenting styles. So if they have a bunch of babies and let them all free range on their own, or if they have one and they invest more parental care into it. And we're also gonna take a look at the way they grow themselves. So we're gonna look at metamorphosis, complete and incomplete, as well as animals simply maturing into their adult form. So we're gonna head in here. This is actually our Great Barrier Reef exhibit uh, in our Australasia Pavilion. It's a little bit dark in here. So as we come in, I'm gonna bring out my own flashlight, see if we can shed some light on uh, the cool animals around us and we'll get started in here. So follow us. All right. So we're gonna get up close here on these eggs and hopefully I can shed a little bit more light on them for you there. So this is a fake egg display that we have in the Australasia Pavilion, uh, but it's one of my favorite to use. Uh, we're trying to get the glare off here for you guys. Um, and that's because it really shows a great example of how uh, turtles are born and come into this world. So this is what we call a clutch of eggs. Um, <laughs> I've mentioned in a couple of videos before, but I really love the naming of groups of things. So a clutch of eggs is one of those names. Um, and you can see the baby sea turtles, they hatch, they emerge, and they come up to the surface. So for these guys, their life cycle begins underground and they start their life when their mom lays them in basically a giant sand hole. Um, and this is where they incubate, spend time, and then they are able to uh, develop, grow, and they come out looking like just basically a mini version of what they're going to be when they're adults. But something very important happens while they're in the egg. Uh, and for a lot of reptiles, 
they have to, uh, their dis, uh, choice or their uh, development of which sex they're going to be when they emerge uh, is decided when they're in their egg. And it's actually decided by the temperature around them. So this is for reptiles and they're actually opposite some of them from each other. So for sea turtles, we have a little saying, we like to say cool uh, dudes and hot chicks. So we say cool for boys and hot for girls. So the sand around the outside of the eggs, depending on what temperature that is when they're incubating, that will determine what sex these baby turtles are. Uh, for other reptiles like crocodiles and alligators, it's actually the opposite. They go more of a uh, female, male, female. So uh, cool, cold girls and warm boys and then really, really hot girls at the end. Um, and that is to help them try and survive. So this sex determinant though is temperature based. And for these guys, uh, it usually stays in a pretty good balance. And if the temperature mixes around uh, throughout the level of the sand, you can have a mix of males and females in the clutch. Um, if it fluctuates too much, unfortunately they won't hatch at all. There's too much variation there. Uh, but one of the major things of climate change is heavily impacting uh, species like turtles and other reptiles around the world. Uh, because as we are noticing climate change take effect on beaches and things like that, not only is there an increase in tropical storms and uh, adverse weather, which can often destroy the nests and the clutches of eggs that are uh, in the beaches, uh, we're also noticing that it is hotter for longer periods of time and longer stretches, which means that these eggs here, for if we remember our little uh, clue for these guys, the cool dudes and hot chicks, it means they're primarily being born female uh, in their species. And for other species, it means that they're primarily being born males. Um, and so there's too many of one of the sexes and there's not enough of a mix for the two of them. So that can be a little damaging to their overall population uh, when it comes to breeding for the next season, once these guys grow up and become sexually mature. Now you'll notice here, you'll see a lot of eggs and you'll see a lot of babies, but you don't see a lot of adult turtles. And that's because uh, these species in front of us are one of the species where the parents have very little maternal instinct and also very little uh, maternal uh, or parental care once the babies have been laid in their eggs. So basically once the mom deposits them in their hole, they are on their own. It is a tough battle from there. They have to emerge through the sand and they have to find their way back to the water. And actually several of these turtles in real life would not actually make it back to the water and back to their home, but that's partly where there's so many of them. We're gonna discuss a little bit later on why uh, egg births tend to have a larger amount of animals around them. Um, and one of the main reasons for these guys is because so many of them won't actually survive to adulthood. Uh, the more of them there are in the beginning, the higher the probability that some of them will survive onward. All right, our next animal is just to my right over here. I absolutely love these guys. If you ever come back when we're open, check them out. I like to call them the Harry Potter frogs. And that's because if you take a really close look at them, these are our frogs in here but they actually kind of look like chocolate frogs to me. Um, and that's because they're so shiny. Frogs are amphibians, so they need to stay in that moist, wet environment all the time. And these guys particularly just look like they are fake. They don't look like they're real frogs to me ever. So frogs are a great example for us. I've got a little diagram here to talk about metamorphosis for them. So this is how they grow and develop. Um, several insects and a lot of amphibians go through this kind of complete metamorphosis. There's some who go through an incomplete version and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but basically they have several distinct steps that go from uh, eggs, they turn into a tadpole, they kind of grow through it and they end up being their mature adult at the end of this cycle. But they look very different um, through their growth cycle as they do when they finish off at the end. That's kind of the important step here is that they have uh, this life cycle around them before they finish as a mature adult. All right, so we're gonna head back out into the light over this way so you can follow me. And we're gonna take a look at one of our other really cool reptiles that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. He's definitely a fan favorite. And he also has a pretty rough start when it comes to the first couple uh, weeks and months of his life. And that's because uh, immediately after being born, this guy has to go up a tree. So come on this way. We're gonna take a look over here. This is our Komodo dragon. You might recognize him. He's been in a couple of videos with us before. This is Keylat. He's pretty impressive. Um, so he is a Komodo dragon. And while he looks very large and fierce now, hopefully you guys can see him. The lighting's not the best in here right now for us. 
Um, while he looks quite impressive right now, when he was just a baby, uh, he was fighting for his life. So when he, when Komodo dragons are first born, uh, their mom will lay them. They are part of an egg birth as well. So I have some uh, eggs here as an example, a little leathery eggs of Komodo dragon. They kind of shriveled up a little bit, but they are kind of a leathery texture when they're uh, first hatched. The mom might stick around for a little bit to kind of defend the eggs for a couple days, maybe. She'll kind of bury them so they can incubate. Uh, but basically after that, the eggs are on their own. The babies are on their own. Uh, when they do hatch and emerge, they have to climb trees right away. And that's because really Komodo dragons, the only thing they, uh, other animal they have to fear in the world is larger Komodo dragons. Um, so when they're born, they can be predated by their own kind. Uh, so they go up trees where it's safe. Keelak can't climb a tree anymore. Uh, while they're up there, they're going to feast on uh, smaller uh, lizards and uh, reptiles around them, maybe some bird eggs, that kind of thing, uh, maybe some larger insects. And then eventually they're going to get too big. They're going to grow and mature. Um, and they eventually have to come back down to the ground where kind of Keelat is now. He's that animal who needs to be on the ground. He can't be up in the tree anymore. All right, we'll try and get one more look at him here. See if we can get a, uh, a better view. He's just laying on top of his log. He absolutely loves to sunbathe in his exhibit. So he's kind of there, he's got some sun poking through on him. Um, and he's not really much of a mover unless he wants to be for food or uh, something's maybe caught his attention. Sometimes when a lot of small kids are running through here, he's a little bit more interested in them for sure. All right, we're gonna come back this way. And we're gonna check out, this is a, a reptile wing in our Australasia pavilion. So we're gonna look at a couple snakes here. We'll mostly just show you guys the animals that we have in here. And I'm just gonna talk a brief second about a couple of them. Uh, for example, oh, where have they gone now? They've moved on us. Oh, he's in the back corner here. This is my favorite snake here at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, he's just in the corner over there. And that's because this is called the red-tailed green rat snake. Um, and I absolutely love them. They're not actually from this uh, area of the world. Uh, these guys are living in here right now uh, as a temporary holding for them. Um, they're usually found in our Indo-Malaya section of the zoo, but I absolutely love these guys because everything you need to know about them is in their name, red-tailed green rat snake. Uh, I think it's the perfect naming for any animal out there. If we continue along this way though, we will see a couple more snakes who are native to the Australasia area of the world. And I actually referenced these guys in front of me here uh, in our last video in the Americas Pavilion when we talked about camouflage. We are speaking about how the outer coverings of animals help them blend in with their habitat. And the two snakes that we looked at in the Americas Pavilion were terrestrial snakes, so they're ground dwelling. So they were covered in browns and beiges as their color scheme. And I held up a photo about our green tree python um, and they're green because they like to live in the trees around them and they need to blend in with that better. Uh, so these guys up here, you can see they blend in and they kind of look like they belong in the trees with their green coloring. Now for growth and life cycles for snakes, there can be a wide variety from them. Some snakes are egg birth and some are simulated live births. So sometimes a female will have eggs inside, the eggs will hatch while they're still inside of her and then she delivers uh, live birth uh, babies after that. So there's kind of a, a variety of how they can give birth here, but it's mostly the same as a lot of our reptiles where once they're born, uh, they're pretty much on their own. Some snakes will stay with the clutch of eggs, like Fifi, a reticulated python, we met in Indo a couple weeks ago as well. Uh, when she has a clutch of eggs, she is a python, she will wrap her body around them and stay there for about three months, incubating the eggs, keeping them warm and safe. Um, and then as they start to emerge, she hasn't eaten in a couple months. So as soon as they start to hatch, uh, she is out of there and she is on her way looking for her uh, meal ticket and some food. Another really cool thing about these guys is I've mentioned in a previous video as well, they have like a leathery texture of egg. Um, and when you think about it, animals who are born an egg, they need to escape or get out of their egg somehow. And if you think in terms of a chicken, they have a nice hard shell uh, for their egg, but they also are born with beaks. So they're able to peck or tap their way out of their shell. Uh, for snakes and other reptiles out there, uh, they grow something called an egg tooth. So if you can see at the front of our snake's uh, face there, um, on these guys right at the tip of their nose, when they're babies, they actually grow a little hard piece of cartilage there called the egg tooth, and it helps them rip out of their egg. Uh, once they get out and they're uh, starting to grow up and mature, they lose that part. Um, they don't need it anymore, but that is how they get out of their eggs. Um, kind of a neat way when you think about it, they're not born with a beak or anything like that. Another really cool thing for growth and development for these guys, they're more of a maturing as well. They're born just being kind of mini versions of themselves. 
in some snakes though, if we look over here, these green tree pythons, they do, their coloration changes throughout their lifetime. So when they're born, they're very brightly colored. So they look like this. Then after seven months, they become a little bit darker. And then when they're full grown, they turn into that nice bright lime green color. And this is actually a great survival te technique that they use. Uh, we've mentioned in previous videos as well about animals who are venomous or poisonous or often brightly colored. Uh, this is an indicator to other species around them. Hey, don't eat me. I might kill you accidentally or on purpose. So these guys can look like other snakes that might be venomous or poisonous out there. Um, and this helps deter predators from eating them when they're young and not able to protect themselves fully. Another really cool thing for snakes as they grow and develop through their life is when they're younger, they're growing very quickly, or at least they're trying to. So they shed their skin quite often. Once they get older, uh, the only really reason they'll shed their scales uh, is to help in any damaged scale. So if they have one that's damaged or they're, um, something's wrong with one of them or a defect, they'll shed that layer of scales to bring out the nice clean ones underneath. But we do have a box here that we can zoom in on in the light of some of our uh, shed that we can see, which is really cool. So you can see all the little scales inside. Something that's pretty cool as well, sometimes when you're here, you'll actually see a shed in the tank with these guys as well. Uh, sometimes they get left in there for a little while if the keepers can't grab them right away. So it's kind of cool, you'll see one draped over some of the sticks or leaves, uh, like it was a snake actually, you know, hanging out on the uh, branches, but it's just their shed. All right, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna move on to more of our mammals now this way. So over here, we've also seen these guys before. Uh, these are our uh, southern uh, nose wombats and also our echidna named Annie. So let me see if we can find someone. I see Matilda's eating there. Let's see if we can find Arthur, there he is. All right, so there is Arthur. He's just in the back there. Hopefully we can get a zoom in on him. He's just kind of hanging out. Maybe we'll try and see Matilda afterwards as well. I know she's just eating right now. So our wombats are kind of our first animal that we're coming across right now that has a very different parenting style than the previous animals we've been looking at. I mentioned that for a lot of reptiles, amphibians, insects, and fish, uh, they are more of the parenting style where we have a lot of babies um, and they kind of fend for themselves. There's a couple outliers to that. Some of those animals will invest more time into their uh, offspring, but for the majority of it, it's mammals and birds who invest the time into their offspring around them. Oh, I think he's walking over the other side here. Um, so take into account if you're a human or maybe if we talked, if you remember you're here for the rhino talk we did a couple weeks ago, uh, a rhino was pregnant for 16 months and even after they give birth, they stay with their baby for two years, teaching it how to be a rhino and living and surviving. Wombats aren't quite that long, um, but it is quite a good amount of time for them. Um, and they also have a pouch for their baby. So once their baby's born, they're about the size of a jelly bean, or we like to say about the size of your thumb fingernail. Uh, and the baby goes into the pouch and will stay there for a couple months, poking their head out every once in a while. Um, kind of seeing what's going on, but they stay in there and they're able to nurse from within the pouch. Um, and then when they get a little bit too big, that's when mom will kick them out. But again, the baby will stay with mom for a little bit longer after that, kind of figuring out the world, seeing what's going on. Usually a typical baby amount for wombats are one to two offspring at a time. Um, and again, it's that mom taking care of them, investing a lot of maternal uh, protection and care into her babies. Now we're gonna look over here and the first thing I'll show you is our little um, photo here. This is what Annie the echidna looks like. We actually have some great photos of her on our Instagram page if you do wanna see it. The reason I'm only showing you the photo and we can scan the exhibit right now is if you remember in previous videos, I have mentioned I've been here for five years and I have never seen Annie the echidna. She is um, a mystery animal to me. I have seen photos of her before, but I, it is my goal to see her in person. Uh, this is for a couple reasons. She really likes digging in tunnels. You'll notice a couple tunnels in here. Her and the wombats uh, dig those. But also she's crepuscular. So she's not really awake at this time of the day. She's more awake in the evening time. Um, so I'm just never here at the same time as she's up, unfortunately. But one day I will see her. Now, Annie's a really cool animal to look at though, because in our classification video, we actually talked about uh, ways that we classify animals and divide them into certain categories. And one of the main categories or characteristics for mammals is that we have a live birth. So think about humans, lion, tigers, bears, all the good animals like that, the wombats, it's a live birth. 
But Annie, the echidna, she's actually giving an egg birth, which is really cool. And so we call these animals monotremes. Um, and so basically what happens is she will have an egg inside of her pouch as well. She also has a pouch. Um, and then the baby can hatch from inside the pouch and stay in there, stay protected. And when it starts to grow its little spiky spines, mom's like, no more, and ejects them from the pouch after that, which is really cool. All right, so unfortunately, it looks like Annie has not made an appearance for us today. So we're going to continue on. We're going to go take a look at another critter who does an incomplete metamorphosis uh, before we head on to our bird section as well. So as we walk by, we'll just give you guys another close-up of some of our cool reptiles on this pathway um, as we walk down to our insects. There's a bearded dragon there. These guys are really cool. You might have a friend who has one as a pet. We also have another python in here. We're going to pass by our green tree python, our emerald tree boa, um, and our, my favorite snake, the red-tailed green rat snake again. All right, so as we walk down this way, there's a couple areas of the zoo I like to call the heebie-jeebie areas. I've said that before. This is another one of those areas down here. We have a couple insect friends who live here. Now they're all really cool. Um, and they do a lot for us in the world. They definitely uh, startle me a little bit. So we're gonna take a look in here really quickly. These are our thorny devils. So right now we have quite a few um, little tiny baby ones that are kind of all over the exhibit. And we're gonna try and find you a more adult version, but if we can't find one, I do have a bio fact. So this is actually what they look like when they're full grown here as well. You guys can see those. These guys are not alive. Uh, they're a bio fact that we use to look at them. Uh, but basically these guys go through a incomplete metamorphosis. And what's that, what that means um, is when they're born, they don't have like a larvae form, they go through a nymph form instead. And they're basically born looking like miniature versions of their adult self as well. Um, and they just grow through a couple different levels as they eat and mature um, to get into their full adult stage, which is really cool. All right, so I'm going to put these guys down, and we are going to head out to our bird section, talk about our last animal, and then head to you guys for questions as well. All right. Okay, so we're going to head out this way here. Okay. All right, let's see if we can find, oh, I think we found one over here. These guys are my favorite bird that we have. I'm actually quite scared of most birds but I do like our Victoria crown pigeons. They are very cool. Um, now I mentioned at the wombats that these guys are uh, a type of bird and birds are tend to be one of those animals who uh, invest more into each of their babies. Um, and these guys are really true at that because they mate for life actually. Um, and they only ever have one offspring at a time. So they'll have one egg and both the male and female will take turns uh, sitting on the egg, uh, incubating it, resting with it. And then once it hatches, they both care for it as well. Um, and it's not a very long time that the baby spends with the parents, but while they're there, uh, they are uh, very well looked after by both mom and dad um, and cared for. And if something happens to the offspring or the baby, uh, the mother will reproduce a new egg to replace it as well. So if there's any predation or anything like that. Alrighty guys, that has brought us to the end of our life cycles talk here. So we're gonna hang out in our pre-flight area for the next couple of minutes while we answer some of your questions. Um, so Jesse, I'm going to throw it back to you and uh, see what we got on that side. See if anyone got our riddle. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for an awesome walk through Mary Ellen. I kind of hope a bird comes close to you so you get a chance to get over your fear live on camera or not. We'll find out. Uh, we did have a bunch of people get the riddle immediately, actually, before you even said it. So Lloyd Duke and Matt O'Connor both got monotremes, which is our answer for our riddle today. Huge Perfect. shout out to them on Slido and YouTube. Uh, a note too for everyone live, a Slido, we have the most people set for our quiz we've ever had. I'm going to start that in just about a minute. Uh, so get ready uh, there for your questions. We've got five live groups joining us today, so I'm going to go to them to see if we've got some questions first. And for everyone else, you can type in questions, YouTube, Slido. We've got groups from Nova Scotia, British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, Newfoundland, and five different states today. So a really exciting, nice, diverse group of people. So I'm going to go to Ms. Martins uh, for our first question. If you have one to kick us off in Kelowna, come on up and uh, take us away. I, um, I was hoping some of my kindergartners might email me a question, but I know some of them might still be in bed right now. Uh, <laughs> when, um, when we were learning together, the children were super interested in molting and snake skins and maybe uh, a question on behalf of them and their interest in that is, are there any other animals that molt? Yeah, yeah for sure. So 
pretty much every animal out there, as they're growing and living and existing in their life, uh, you're going to be shedding your skin things like that. Humans do it as well. It's called molting, shedding. There's a couple different variations of it, but it's basically losing that outer layer and replacing it with newer, fresher, healthier layers underneath. Here's some birds coming in behind me here. Um, so humans do it as well. You can see that we do shed our skin. Um, animals do it in different ways. So for humans, uh, we are shedding our skin as well, but we do it more piece by piece, like small uh, flakies. Uh, constantly it's what's in dust and things like that in our air it's all around us uh, if you ever get a really bad sunburn or anything like that you'll notice larger pieces might peel off um, and that's your skin again trying to replace uh, the burnt or damaged skin underneath with healthier skin birds do it as well pretty frequently uh, if you ever hear when we reopen we have peacocks that free walk around the zoo site and at the end of the day sometimes you see uh, people with peacock feathers I don't recommend doing it though they're not really clean and dirty we don't like people who encourage them to do it but you'll often see them around the site. Peacocks, they will just shed their feathers as they go, they mold them off um, for regrowth if any of them are damaged, anything like that. Uh, sometimes as well, some bird species will also pull feathers that are dying uh, to use as nesting material for themselves, uh, so they get that. Uh, reptiles, reptiles like Helax or Komodo dragon and other larger uh, lizards, they will also shed their skin, but instead of in one whole uh, piece, like a snake will do it, they'll do it in larger, just kind of flaky pieces here and there. Um, and they can't kind of wiggle out of their shed the same way the snakes can. So a lot of animals like to have rubbing things. So actually for some of our really large mammals like rhinos and hippos, you'll notice in their exhibits, essentially things that look like giant industrial car washes. Um, and those are pieces of enrichment that we use for our animals for them to rub up against. You'll see a lot of them kind of rubbing on it. Uh, they get their nice itch and that's them peeling away dead skin as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Great first question, guys. Uh, a huge shout out to Andreas, too, for getting our quiz. All four questions in 31 seconds. He won the quiz today. Kudos to you, man. You've been joining in for all our zoo sessions uh, all two months long. All right. I'm going to go to Miss Creel uh, joining us in Oakville, Ontario. If you have a question, come on up. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. I just want to, I didn't quite catch the name of the bird that you mentioned when you first work, walked into the enclosed area that mates for life. Oh yeah. So the big blue ones there in the back, uh, that's called the Victoria crown pigeon. They're actually the largest species of pigeon in the world. Um, and they're currently listed as vulnerable right now on the red list. So it means their numbers are doing sort of okay in the wild but they are on a slight decline for uh their population sizes uh now they're not really close to the camera right now hopefully they do come a little closer if not everyone should look up victoria crown pigeon when you finish this program because they're the most beautiful amazing pigeon in the entire world so if you're not a fan of pigeons you will be by the end of this if you check them out um all right i'm going to take a slido question from juliet in oshawa and huge thank you to you for joining in so many of our programs too so she wants to know, why do baby frogs have tails, but adults don't, and how come they lose their tail? Yeah, for sure. So that's a great question. That has to do with how they grow up. So amphibian, the word itself actually means on both sides or kind of in between the two sides. So it means they start their life in the water and they end their life on land. Unless you're an axolotl, you kind of get stuck in the middle of it there. Um, but so for frogs, being in the water, um, although it might be easy to kick around, they have nice big webbed feet. But when their babies are younger, uh, they don't have as big a feet and it might be harder for them to move. So having that tail helps them maneuver around the water. And once they're adults, although most of them can swim and do stay near water, they primarily live on land, but in moist environments. So they don't really need that tail anymore. Um, and they can start to lose it and they grow their legs instead that help them hop around when they're on the land. A tail is really helpful in the water, in the water but for frogs, it's not so helpful on land for them. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna to go to Ms. Hockenhall's group uh, in Thunder Bay. If you have a question for us, Ms. Hockenhall, come on up. Hi, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Um, I have a question in regards to the wombat. W was it the wombat that she was talking about when she was saying that it's, um, it's, it's nurses inside of the pouch? And um, I think she said that it, it's, it's like the jelly bean size? Yeah. Was that yeah, the wombat? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so they actually do nurse inside the pouch. And a, kind of a really cool thing that happens is once the baby actually latches on uh, to the mother's nipple to produce, it actually swells. So the baby can't let go for the first little while. Um, and so they are constantly feeding, trying to get them to grow. Because yes, they are about the size of my fingernail or about the size of a jelly bean. 
when they're first born. That's the same size for kangaroos. They're roughly about that size as well. So quite tiny, tiny little baby animals who need quite a bit of assistance for the first several months of their life. Um, and for most of them, they spend at least three months or so inside the pouch. Uh, they don't come out at all. They're just in there feeding and sleeping constantly. Um, and then after about that four month mark, they're kind of big enough to, you know, investigate the world around them, see what's happening and they'll start poking their head out. Uh, and eventually the mom will make the call at some point. Nope, you are too big. You are not coming back inside the pouch. And the baby starts living their life on the outside from then on. Fantastic. Another thing I encourage people to look out, look up when they get uh, finish this program is neonates. So baby marsupials, and you can see how cute and tiny they are when they begin their lives. Uh, they're really, really cool. Not something that we could show today, but uh, fantastic. And I urge you to check it out. All right, I'm gonna take another quick question from Andreas on Slido. And he wants to ask, how often do snakes shed? Yeah, for sure. So it depends on the type of snake and also the age of the snake and how much they are eating at one time. Um, and I know that's the kind of the worst answer to say it all depends on everything, but to give you an idea of it, uh, snakes, when they're babies, they're trying to grow really quickly. So they're eating a lot of small meals, uh, over and over again on a more regular basis, uh, to grow bigger. Cause when they are tiny, even if they are a venomous snake, anything can eat you when you're tiny. So you want to get as big as possible and mature to your full adult size where you have a better chance of survival. So when they're younger, they're going to be shedding way more frequently than when they're older. For example, um, think of like a, a snake that we have here versus Fifi, our reticulated python, who's about uh, 10 feet long. She barely sheds. So she needs to only shed now if she has damaged scales. Um, and even then at a snake that size, she's not gonna be able to do that nice, perfect one clean shed that you can see sometimes for smaller snakes. She won't be able to wiggle out of her whole scale uh, section. She's gonna flake more in chunks and pieces here and there. It wouldn't look as, uh, cool for a snake that size anymore. Yep, fantastic. All right, I'm going to go to Miss uh, Bellows. Uh, if you have a question in Thunder Bay, come on up. Oh, let's just get you demuted. So Miss Bellows, it doesn't want me to let me demute your mic. So you're going to have to demute it yourself and then we'll take your question. Okay. Can Perfect. you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for your uh, virtual tour today. Um, I have a, a question. Um, my students, my grade two students have had some experience with the monarch butterfly and um, watching that metamorphosis from caterpillar um, to butterfly. Um, and we watched that in the classroom in September. My question is, does the Toronto Zoo have a monarch exhibit? Um, yeah, good question. So we don't have uh, specifically like monarchs themselves, but in our Indo-Malaya section of the zoo, we have a uh, Malayan woods section. So it's right between the rhinos and the, the orangutans. It's kind of a smaller building. Our clouded leopards live in there. And while you're in there, it is a free flight bird area and also a free flight butterfly area, which is really cool. Um, so the butterflies that have matured um, and grown and emerged from their chrysalis are able to fly around freely. Uh, if you stand still or you're wearing really bright colors, sometimes they also land on you, which is pretty cool. And then also we have these stages of the butterfly. So just like you're saying, your students were able to watch them. We do have a diagram uh, showing and depicting each stage that they go through. But also you can see uh, we have all of our chrysalises that are currently uh, waiting to emerge. Uh, you can see them through a glass wall. So we have them all pinned up. Um, and if you're lucky and you're there at just the right time, you can actually see some of them start to emerge themselves. Once they have emerged, the keepers notice they're able to pull them from that tank and release them into the entire exhibit overall. Super cool. Thank you so great. much. Thank you very much. Yeah, great question. Uh, for everyone who, who might have been to the Toronto Zoo before or might be able to go there when it reopens again, I urge you to go to that pavilion the moment it opens in the morning because quite often a lot of the butterflies are sunning themselves along the path you can walk along. So you've got to be careful and avoid them, but it's one of the most beautiful experiences you can have at the entire Toronto Zoo. So do check that out. All right, I want to take a question from YouTube before we go to another one of our teachers. So uh, Miss Mendez, a uh, great six-year-old grandson, wants to know um, what how the green pythons babies that hatch inside the eggs inside the mother get out. So how did that whole process <laughs> unfold? <laughs> okay, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I know it's kind of a weird thing to think about having that simulated live birth. Uh, so it's very similar to a live birth itself. So, or uh, an egg birth, it's kind of coming out of the same uh, hole for the snakes, but basically the female has a couple of the eggs inside of her, uh, the babies emerge from there. And then from then it's just a simulated live birth from that afterwards. 
Very cool. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Ms. Creel wanted to pass along a question uh, back to something that you covered when you were talking about echidnas. So there are nocturnal animals, which a lot of us will know come out at night. There are diurnal animals, which come out during the day. You said a different term for animals at dawn and dusk. Can you remind us what that term is? Yeah, for sure. So I said crepuscular, which is a, a very fun word to say. Um, <laughs> I recommend you looking it up and looking how to say it. Basically, it means animals who are awake at dawn and dusk. So first thing in the morning, first thing in the evening, but asleep during the middle of the day and the middle of the night. And this is a really uh, good evolutionary strategy for a lot of prey species, because when you think about those times of the day, the sun is just setting and rising. So oftentimes it's right on the horizon, which means there is light shining in your eyes. So if you're a predator trying to hunt something, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do it if the sun is glaring in your face. Also, at those times of the days, you're often to see fog or mist. Uh, just as everything's kind of cooling down or heating up from the night or the day. Um, and that acts as another layer of camouflage for a lot of those prey, as it's harder to navigate through the mist as animals can't see them as easily. So the prey have adapted to be awake at those hours. Um, it's also cooler if you're in the savanna, middle of the day, it's really hot, really, really, really hot. Our animals are sleeping in the savanna in the middle of the day. But at dawn and dusk, it's a little bit more manageable where they can be out grazing, roaming around that kind of thing. Fantastic. All right, we're going to take probably one more question. I'm going to go to Miss Stephens group, Steffler's group in Cortez, Ontario. So Miss Steffler, if you have a question for us, just unmute your mic and you should be good to go. Let's see if we can get that going on. So Miss Steffler, if you get a chance to do that, great. I'll come back to you in just two seconds. Uh, we have someone on YouTube named Claire and she wants to know, do birds lose their feathers as they age? Do the babies look different than the adults? Sorry, could you just repeat the end part of that, Jesse? Yeah, do baby birds look different from adult birds? They change as they get older. Okay, yeah. So yeah, um, if you've ever had the opportunity to see a baby bird, um, it kind of looks like a naked mole rat, to be honest. We've seen them in a couple other videos. Uh, they're usually kind of strange looking. Uh, they're not born uh, with feathers, but they kind of have a fluff usually on them for most of them. Um, and they've got their big eyes in their head. Um, it's a very kind of creepy thing to see at first, honestly. Uh, so they do need a lot of that parental care and they need to be kept warm by their parents. Uh, you'll notice when birds are babies and they start to get their feathers in, that's usually when they're about to take flight for the first time because those feathers are super important to them flying. They need those feathers uh, in order to get the right lift and movement for them. So yeah, when they're born, they, are, uh, they don't look at all like they do when they are uh, fully developed. Uh, it's a very kind of um, alien-like little baby that usually happens. <laughs> If, if we didn't know you were slightly biased against birds from your earlier statement, <laughs> the naked mole rat alien reference, that would have done it for us. So thank you for that, Mary yeah. Ellen. Um, so we are getting near the end of our session. So what I want to ask Mary Ellen is, uh, where, can, where can kids go that are watching live on YouTube right now to learn more about what the zoo is doing and the programs you guys have going on, even though you're closed? Yeah, for sure. So there's so much that uh, you guys can do at home to learn more about what we're doing. Uh, like Jesse said in the beginning, we've done about 10 or so videos with Explore by the Seed Your Pants. So you can go onto their YouTube page, check out our previous videos. We also have resources linked for every video on the Toronto Zoo website. Jesse's going to put a link for it in the description as well, uh, where you guys can go check out uh, resources to do at home that relate to each video we've done. Uh, there's also live keeper talks that the Toronto Zoo is doing on our own personal Facebook page every single day at 1 p.m. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, TikTok, I always do that, and Twitter as well. Uh, so check us out on social media um, and keep updated with us for when we're back open and you're able to come and visit us. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much again, Mary Ellen, for a fantastic presentation. I have put the Zoo to You resource in the YouTube chat bar. Do check out our channel. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, see more things that are coming up, join us on social media, or donate if you like what we're doing for digital education. Without further ado, thank you so much again. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today, and I uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 Eastern, we do programs of the Zoo, so you can check back in with us in two days. Thanks so much. Bye for now. Perfect.